Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I understand that the theme you've chosen for this evening's discussion session is religion and its psychological effects. Let's begin with the first question. Mr. Berman, do you agree with the observation that most people are religious for psychological and not philosophical reasons? If so, do you consider religious belief to be a form of psychological problem? I certainly agree with the observation that, as you put it, most people are religious for psychological rather than philosophical reasons. I'm inclined to say that everyone who is religious is, in my judgment, is for psychological reasons. To begin with, we have to realize that the overwhelming majority of people in the world who are religious today were raised to be religious. Their first indoctrination into the teachings of religion came from parents, family, relatives, later on from church and school perhaps, so that their exposure to religion far preceded any appreciation of the philosophical arguments that had been adduced to support religious belief. The emotional commitment is years earlier in the person's development than any arguments he may subsequently memorize to support his belief. Furthermore, I'm convinced that even when, as occasionally, not too often happens, an individual who is not raised religiously becomes, quote, converted, unquote, in his adult life, we are still dealing with psychological factors. Now, why do I say so? I'm going to, for the moment, talk specifically about the modern age when so much is not available to people. It's harder to talk about what was or was not evident to people hundreds or thousands of years ago. But I do not believe that any rational person, given the knowledge available to him in the 20th century, can accept the teachings of religion with its endorsement of mysticism, supernaturalism, otherworldliness, and so forth, purely on the grounds of philosophical persuasion, for the very simple reason that I don't think the arguments are even plausible. I mean the arguments that support religion. I don't think that anybody embraces the church because he was impressed by the philosophical arguments, even if he heard one he couldn't immediately refute. Perhaps, for example, the most sophisticated argument to defend the notion of God is the so-called argument from contingency. Well, let's say that an average person, even if he grasped the argument, might not immediately see how to refute it. That wouldn't give anybody religious faith. That wouldn't make him accept all the trappings and all the other teachings. At the very most, or otherwise clear-headed and honest, he might say that he has heard an argument that he does know how to refute for the existence of some force in the universe that generated the universe as he understands it, period. That doesn't yet imply an acceptance of all the numerous teachings of religion. Another point related to the one I just mentioned but different is the immense amount of transparent rationalization that people exhibit when they try to discuss this subject, such as the following. They begin by cooking up or accepting or spouting some particular doctrines that make them argue the notion of God is plausible or of some force in the universe is plausible. The next second, they are already talking about accepting Jesus Christ as the Savior, the doctrine of an afterlife, perhaps endorsing the notion of original sin, and a host of other precepts which are in no sense whatsoever logically entailed by or imply even the notion of God they originally set forth, even if one granted it any kind of validity, which suggests that their real attachment to those doctrines is emotional or psychological, and that even when they put forth skillful arguments, if one wants to say there are any, I don't especially think they're skillful, but that's a separate question, I don't believe the motive is genuine philosophical conviction. I don't think it has been for many hundreds of years. I'm not prepared to evaluate the psychological processes of people living longer back in history in more earlier stages 
thousand years ago, even seven or eight hundred years ago, or people who are simply very, very ignorant and to whom it doesn't occur to them to question or challenge some of these doctrines. So let's even omit people who are not too intelligent or have no education, and let's even hang a question mark over them because it might be argued that there are some people whose intelligence is so modest that they've heard certain of these doctrines and it simply never occurred to them to question them. So it's a problem of intellectual limitation. We could even allow that for some people living today, let's say. But let's assume we're talking about anybody of any degree of intelligence and even modest education. Then I would say it's not a philosophical conviction, it's a psychological position. Now that leads to the second part of your question. Would I then say that religion or belief in religion is a psychological problem? Well, I would say rather that it's the consequence of unhealthy or undesirable psychological mental processes. It's not the consequence of a person who is consistently trying to be in good contact with reality. I think there are a lot of avoidance mechanisms at work in the psychology of such a person. I think he derives many gains or unacknowledged benefits from his belief in religion that makes it appealing to him. So in that sense, I would have to say, yes, I regard it as a psychological problem. I would also say that the acceptance of religion tends to generate psychological problems to the extent that a person takes the precepts of religion at all seriously and tries to live by them, practice them in his own life. Yes? What is the primary psychological purpose that belief in God serves the yes. I think that, again, we have to go back to the fact that almost everyone first encounters the belief in God in childhood. And for many people, looking at it very simply and commonsensically, it's experienced as overwhelmingly difficult to entertain the notion that that which they have been taught all their life could be wrong. The mere idea that mother and father taught this, friends believe this, teachers believe this, and now as an adult somebody says, hey, there isn't any God. The mere idea of questioning that much and breaking mentally or intellectually with all those people is frightening psychologically frightening, anxiety-provoking. And therefore, if what I'm saying is true, then one factor, you ask about motivation, it is less anxiety-provoking, the person believes, to go on paying lip service to the notion of God than to challenge it. That's not the only reason, but it's one reason. Several others occur to me. Some of these are obvious and have been pointed out by many people. For example, it's often put that for many people, leaning on the notion of a God is a form of childlike dependency. The notion that there is some big daddy in the sky who won't let anything bad happen to me. Somebody that I can appeal to in time of need, in time of despair, in time of helplessness. So there's an obvious dependency factor involved. I think another very interesting psychological factor, a bit more complex, I hope I can make it clear, is the following. In the psychology of self-esteem, I put forth the concept of social metaphysics. And what is important about that concept as it bears upon your question is the following. In my theory of social metaphysics, what I consider very basic is my characterization of the type of psychological dependency in which what is most important, most real, to the person who I call a social mental physician, is not facts as such, but the beliefs, opinions, values, expectations, preferences, terms, standards, ideas of other people, so that the consciousness of others, reality for him, of much greater importance than raw facts of reality. That's what I call social metaphysics. Now, I see a certain profound application of that to this issue, especially in people who cannot accept the idea that existence exists, that the universe always did exist, and that it's meaningless to talk about who created the universe. Now, why do I say that? Because it's well known that if you're 
going to raise the question of who created the universe, to say God did answers nothing because it then generates the question of who created God. It doesn't really solve anything.